All right. Make sure I don't have any more quizzes to give back. Did everybody have fun with Bunsen burners yesterday? Was that more fun than just watching me set stuff on fire? Hopefully nothing got lit on fire that wasn't supposed to be lit on fire, but everybody was able to see the colors and looked looked pretty good. It's a little bit different when you do it with the tiny amounts, but. Towards the end, a lot of people are seeing multiple colors in there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Why yeah, cross contamination different definitely. If we were, um, if we were all trying, working really hard to keep everything as clean as possible and keep track of things. The way that, that that's actually done with a group this size is typically you use the same wire for each of the same elements and you shift to different stations that way. Um, but that's a lot to keep track of with 30 people in a classroom. Um, and so I just figured have everybody responsible for their own. And then as long as you can try and keep it clean or burn it, you know, get it really, really red hot before you you um, go to the next sample, that that might probably work better. But then that's the other reason why I'm, you know, pick the, the most subtle flame first. That potassium one is definitely the hardest to see, right? Because it's that really kind of pale purple. Um, that's the one that, that could be overwhelmed if you got some cross-contamination. Um, so I went through all the quiz questions. If uh, if I didn't address your quiz question on Wednesday or today, then I left you an, a comment on the assignment that you can go back and look at, um, as well as usually on those quizzes. If there's any, if if it's not something simple like a sig fig um, deduction, then a lot of times I'll leave a little note what what you did wrong if I can see what you did wrong in, in some of the uh, uh, quiz answers. Um, we now know that temperatures of flames don't necessarily equate to different colors um, because we found out that you can get different color flames all sorts of different ways, right? Um, so, but there is at the, at the most basic level, if you get objects hot enough, like we saw this with the nichrome wire, you got it hot enough, it started glowing, even though that wasn't really like a flame test, right? That's just the wire glowing. They call that black body radiation. A black black body radiation is basically just anything that gets hot enough will start to give off photons just by virtue of, of you know being able to excite electrons. Um, and and when they fall back down, they create photons that way. Um, and in general, you go, you will progress towards not necessarily white hot. But you can go, you can get really, really hot so to the point where you're giving off um, photons of all sorts of different colors, um, which appears as white light. That's why they call it white hot, is when you get something hot enough that's giving off photons of all sorts of different uh, colors. On Earth, it would be pretty hard to get something hot enough to get a measurable amount of anything in the UV because then you're talking about getting something hotter than the surface of the sun. It's doable, but there are other ways we can make UV light or X-rays or gamma rays that don't involve just using sheer heat to do it that are more effective. Um, the reason the sun has the color it does in addition to being made of hydrogen and helium um, is also because it has the temperature it does. Hotter stars, will have their solar spectrum shifted more towards the UV, will give off higher energy photons. Um, so it's there is some correlation with how hot something is and the wavelengths of light it gives off, but there's also other things. Those energy gaps between the different energy levels will also kind of control and dictate um, what photons, what colors you see. Um, and this one, this question is probably because of the way that I refer to things. Why is an unstable element bad? It's not bad. Bad implies a value judgment. It's just, it just is unstable. Unstable things 
don't last very long. That doesn't make them bad. It just means that they're going to progress to something more stable. Um, and so if you have an unstable element um, that has a, the wrong ratio of neutrons to protons, it'll spontaneously degrade into something more stable. Um, that's just kind of the way that the universe works. Um, you can get back to that from um, the laws of thermodynamics, specifically the second law of thermodynamics, which, which states that any spontaneous process um, that occurs is only spontaneous if it's increasing the entropy of the universe. And entropy can be thought of as, as disorder or randomness or number of possibilities. Um, and in general, from this, you can actually work backwards to get, okay, we'll turn that into joule and joules instead of um, entropy units. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, but basically, things just naturally do that. That's something we can kind of explain with theories, scientific theories, but it's just the way the universe behaves on some level. Unstable things don't last very long because they progress towards more stable things. Um, why do acids dissolve hard materials? It depends on what the material is. Some materials, acids actually don't, don't dissolve very well at all. Um, some metals, acids will dissolve quite well because they actually will oxidize them and turn them into ions. Um, so when you actually dissolve a piece, we'll do a lab where we dissolve some metal into an acid. And basically what you're doing is you're, you take the hydrogen from the acid and it gets turned from being a hydrogen ion to being hydrogen gas. And the metal turns from being a metal to a metal ion. And most metal ions are soluble in water. So it's not so much that you're, you're pulling it apart so much as you're letting those atoms react to become more stable. Um, and that's one of the ways that you can do that with the metal is, is by using acid. Acids don't work on everything though, right? Really strong acids can, they can burn through wood, they can go through metal, but they can't go through plastic. Depends on the plastic, I suppose. But then other things that will have no effect on metal, like acetone, will dissolve plastic, no problem. So it's not like there's one, one solvent that will dissolve everything. Um, it depends on what you're trying to dissolve. Um, probably the single closest thing that we have to a something that'll dissolve anything is called aqua regia, um, which is a mixture of, I think it's three parts concentrated sulfuric acid to one part concentrated nitric acid. Um, and you can dissolve most minerals with that. You can dissolve gold, you can dissolve um, mercury sulfides, which are really, really stable. Um, you can actually even dissolve glass to some extent um, by using that. Which And that aqua regia actually leads to a kind of fun story. Um, there was a uh, Nobel Prize winning Jewish scientist in, I think it was in Denmark, maybe? Um, somewhere in Northern Europe that got invaded by the Nazis during World War II. And he had his Nobel Prize, which is a solid gold medal, like an Olympic gold medal, um, in his lab. And he didn't have time to get it out of his lab before he had to leave. Um, so his co-workers that didn't have to evacuate because they weren't Jewish. Um, they actually took his gold Nobel Prize medal, dissolved it in aqua regia, labeled it properly, put it on the shelf in the storeroom and left it there. Um, they couldn't just leave it there because Hitler was seizing, the Nazis were seizing all the gold to try and fund more of their, their war machine. Um, so they just dissolved it in aqua regia, labeled it, put it on a shelf, left it there till after the war, then to, um, got the gold to precipitate back out of solution by neutralizing the acid solution after the war. And they were able to recast his, his Nobel Prize medal from the exact same gold um, atoms after the war, which is kind of a fun story. Um, turns out chemists are kind of clever sometimes. Um, especially if you know how to label things, they just labeled it properly, but nobody ever thought to look for a clear colorless solution um, when they were looking for gold. 
Uh, let's see. We'll do a couple more random ones. We don't, because we have time today. What can you do with a chemical engineering degree? Um, chemical engineering is basically taking anything that it, anything that you can produce using chemistry and trying to troubleshoot and make it profitable, um, the process of selling it or producing it at large scale. So classically, chemical engineers go into oil. Petroleum engineers is what, up until about 1990s, about 90% of, of chemical engineers went into oil because there were tons of jobs, it paid really well, um, and it was a, interesting problems to solve. Uh, these days, there's a lot more going on with, with um, solar panels, trying to produce new types of batteries, things like that, scaling up something you can do in lab and trying to produce it on a scale that you could actually sell it to um, a huge number of people. Anytime there's a scale up involved or production of something for sell for sale, that's chemical engineers. The chemists are the ones who first come up with it. The chemical engineers are the ones who monetize it or find a way to bring it to market. Um, so it's a different set of problems. Chem chemists think, how can we do this? Chemical engineers think, how can we do this safely and cheaply? Hopefully they're thinking safely. They're supposed to be thinking safely, um, but that's part of OSHA's job too. Um, somebody asked about fermentation. Fermentation, there's a really simple answer to this, is fermentation is what happens when aerobic organisms don't have access to oxygen. So we see this in humans, in most, most mammals see this in the form of lactic acid in your muscles. If you lift weights or you do sprints and your muscles get sore, you probably have heard, oh, that's from the lactic acid. It's because if you exercise to the point where you're not able to get enough oxygen to your muscles as, it's, as they're burning sugar, um, what you get is a shorter process, a shorter biochemical process. You're not able to take the sugar and turn it all the way to CO2. Instead, you produce lactic acid. Different microorganisms produce a variety of things when they are have access to sugar but not enough oxygen so yeast produces co2 when and when it has access to oxygen but then when it runs out of oxygen it produces alcohol ethanol um anything any bacteria that produce cheeses or yogurts or things like that they're just producing different types of byproducts as a result of that anaerobic fermentation so fermentation in general is just I, I misspoke. Fermentation is anaerobic respiration when you still have access to the, your fuel source, but not to oxygen. Um, and that's sort of a way to, you can get some energy to your cells, but not necessarily enough for it to be long-term. Um, and so pretty much any of those fermentation processes can occur. We just don't, we don't usually refer to it in our own bodies is fermentation, but it's the same process. Lactobacillus does the same thing that our cells do. It makes lactic acid when it runs out of oxygen, just like our cells do. Um, and that's how you get things like sour beers or yogurt, um, or I wanna say lactobacillus is one of the big components in kombucha. Um, kombucha is ferments using, using a uh, mixture of microorganisms called a SCOBY. Has anybody heard that? Has anybody done brewed any kombucha on their own? It's a pretty easy thing that you can make yourself. You just have to get this SCOBY. It's kind of like a sourdough starter. SCOBY stands for something like self-contained, no, uh, something colony of bacteria and yeast. Is there a brewer's course that's, that's offered by any, like, no, I offered one at SNC one year in, uh, in Incline Village. I did chemistry of making beer. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't offered one. I haven't seen one around here in a while. Um, I know that there's a group of, of dads that get together on Sunday mornings and brew beer together, um, in South Lake Tahoe. Davis does. Um, in fact, if anybody knows, uh, that they also serve food. So you might've been there, Sidellis over by the DMV. 
um, is a um, former LTCC student who transferred to Davis and got his wine making and beer brewing degree from Davis. Um, you can actually get a whole degree in in making beer or wine from Davis. Um, and then he came back up here and started started his own brewery. They make really good pickles. Pickling is usually a fermentation too. If you're doing it from scratch, if you're doing it true pickling, um, not just throw a whole bunch of vinegar and salt in a in a jar um, with some veggies. Pickling is usually a fermentation process too. Um, we're going to talk about this last one. I, I meant to move this one. When we get into covalent bonds, we'll talk about how electronic orbitals interact with each other. Because and this is also one of the whole why do we why do we care so much about electron configurations? Why do we spend so much time talking about orbitals? How does this matter? Um, it matters because it's the basis for other things that will. So yeah, if you go into if you're a, a doctor, you're not going to necessarily need to do electron configurations in your everyday life. But you are at some level going to need to understand how biochemistry works and how molecular shapes um, affect how, how medication works. Um, and that's all based on atomic orbitals. So we're sort of setting the table, but giving a good base so that um, when we get into electronic orbitals interacting with each other, it makes more sense. Those are the random quiz questions. Um, what's the what's different about writing electron electron configurations with ions versus just following the periodic table for neutral atoms? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, so if you know what the charge is already, you can still work out how many electrons you have, right? So a lot of times you write your electron configuration for the neutral element first, and then you just amend it. If it's a negative charge, you just add a couple extra electrons or one extra electron. Um, and if it's, if it's a positive charge, you just take away a couple valence electrons based on what the charge is, All right? So for instance, if we looked at um, germanium can be a plus two or a plus four. Let's look at germanium. So let's do germanium when it's neutral. And then we'll do germanium when it's plus two. And germanium when it's plus four. So it's more than 18 electrons, so I would I would let you start from argon. Um, but just for the sake of reviewing, I'm going to write it out the whole way, at least for this first one. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. That gets us to argon, right? So from there... So, okay, we're trying to get to germanium when it's neutral. Well, we've got four S block, two. Then we've got D block, which is offset by one row, right? So it's three D, 10, four P, what? Two. So that's germanium when it's neutral. When germanium is plus two, what changes? We lost two electrons, right? Which two electrons are we going to lose first? Lose those ones first. So germanium plus two is argon, and then 4s2, 3d10. We just got rid of those. Doesn't matter where they go in this case. We're just doing electron configuration of an of an um, ion. We're not talking about where the other electrons went. We're just saying it has lost two electrons. What energy level and what orbital did it lose it from? 
What about if germanium is a plus four? Yeah, we're gonna we have two more electrons we need to take away, right? So might as well be out of the fourth energy level. We're not gonna break up a full d orbital. Once you get a full d orbital, you're not gonna break it up. Generally speaking, so germanium plus four is just argon three d ten. All right, so these electron configurations with ions don't treat them any differently than your electron configurations normally. Write your normal electron configurations out, and then if it's a negative charge, it's really easy. You just add however many extra electrons you have. And usually that's going to correspond to filling up um, a p orbital. If it's a positive charge, start with your from your base electron configuration and you just take away the highest energy electrons. Um, somebody asked about what is the purpose of the shells? Well, there's not really a purpose because purpose implies that it's designed or has some goal in mind. The goal is just the second law of thermodynamics. Things that happen, happen because they de they increase the overall entropy in the universe. So why do these orbitals exist? Well, because positives are attracted to negatives, but the electrons are so small and they're limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uncertainty in position times uncertainty in momentum must be greater than or equal to a constant. Well, if you knew where the electron was, if you knew that the electron was in the nucleus or sitting on top of the nucleus, you'd know exactly where it was, right? And you'd also know what speed it was moving at, what its momentum was, because it'd be moving at the same the same um, speed as the rest of the nucleus, right? So you can't have electrons fall all the way down to the nucleus because that would violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You also can't just have them at any random height because electrons behave in a way that you only can have certain energies, right? Like the, the harmonics on the guitar string. So it's not so much that the, the orbitals exist for any particular reason. It's another case of this is how the universe works. And we're just coming up with better ways of explaining why the universe behaves the way it does. But on some level, it's, it's what electrons do. What's what things do when they get that small? They behave in this non-continuous way, in this quantum way. Last two before we get into some more review of other topics of ionic compounds. Um, are there elements that have not been discovered yet? Have we talked about that one yet? Not not in this class, I don't think. El chemistry finished the seventh row of the periodic table. Are we done? No. Um, how did we finish the seventh row of the periodic table? Does anybody know how they make new elements? You can take a stab. Yeah. They just keep adding more protons, um, they, which is, gets kind of hard to do when you are dealing with something that's so small you can't use tweezers or anything to, to move it around. It's what a particle accelerator is for. Basically, you make new elements and new nuclei by just taking charged particles like protons and you just put them put them in, uh, in front of a giant electromagnet. So what a particle accelerator is, is basically a giant electromagnet that where you can push things around in a circle or in a straight line really, really fast. If you get these things going fast enough and you slam them into each other, sometimes you can slam a proton into a nucleus hard enough that it gets embedded in the nucleus. And then you have a new element. Yeah.
So antimatter is, it's the same as regular matter in every way that matters, no pun intended. Um, it's functionally identical to matter. The only difference is, is that the charges on protons and neutron and uh, protons and electrons are flipped. You can have an, an anti-gold atom, a gold anti-atom, anti-gold atom. Um, you can make what are called anti-protons or anti-hydrogen, um, which is basically the same, has all the same properties, same energy levels, even just with where the protons are the size of an electron. Well, they're not really the size of an electron. It's where the electrons have a positive charge and the protons have a negative charge. Um, and we actually can't detect, there could be entire galaxies made of antimatter. We can't tell though, because the light that comes from them looks just like the light from normal matter, because all those energy levels are the same. And the only way we have of knowing what other galaxies are made of is by looking at the light that comes off like those flame tests. So if we had, were able to do a flame test with antimatter, it would look just like our regular matter. The difference is if you let antimatter run into regular matter, um, they both disappear. Yeah, and they, they disappear and all of that matter that disappears um, gives off energy according to this equation. The change in energy is equal to the change in mass times the speed of light squared. If you have an antimatter reaction, a whole bunch of mass disappears really, really fast. And in doing so, it generates a whole bunch of energy, like more than a nuclear reaction amount of energy. Um, but it still follows our same rules for how the universe works, for how matter behaves. It's just there's a sign. You can think of it like there's a sign error. Um, there's an extra negative somewhere that causes the, those charges to be flipped. Would that be an alternative to uh, fusion reactions for generating electricity? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of sci-fi um, from the, especially from back in the 60s, um, talked about antimatter generators, antimatter uh, reactors on spaceships and things like that, um, because it effectively, it effectively is a nuclear reaction, um, except instead of, the mass of a nucleus changing by just a little bit and giving off energy, it changes by a whole lot, it goes to zero. Um, really, the, the trick though is you have to put more energy into making the antimatter, um, at least in our solar system, than you could get out. So it could be work as an energy storage. In theory, you could put a whole bunch of electrical or solar energy into making antimatter. Um, and at Berkeley, I think they've actually done few years ago, I saw a headline that they were able to make almost a gram of antimatter, of antiprotons, by keeping it separated from all the regular matter by doing it in a vacuum. Yeah, and then they, they kept it isolated without touching it by using electric electrical fields. Basically, they kind of similar to the way that maglev trains work by using magnets to keep the train from from falling down you can kind of keep something contained by using electrical fields. Um, and they were able to do that. And I think it they were able to make it last almost a 10th of a second, um, which was pretty good, all things considered. Um, so we're a long ways away from being able to use antimatter, but we know it exists and we know what it is. Uh, we just can't really make it at scale at this point. Um, and we wouldn't have much of a use for it if we did, because it, there's no way to release the energy slowly if you have antimatter. Fusion's a lot, got a lot more going for it in that respect. Last but not least, um, what do I recommend for tutoring if you're if you're not able to get in-person help? If you're not able to stick around and ask me questions, um, Khan Academy. Khan Academy actually got its start in chemistry. Um, Sal Khan was actually trying to tutor his niece who was taking OCHEM uh, in college and they lived across the country from each other. So he was started recording videos on YouTube, um, tutoring his niece in organic chemistry. And she started sharing them with her friends in her class and it blew up 
So Khan Academy is strongest at chemistry. It's really good at chemistry, specifically OCHEM, but also GenChem as well. So there's a lot of, of good resources out there. Um, there's also a really good guy whose channel I recommend. Um, his channel, I think, is Professor Dave Explains. Professor Dave Explains. He was just a grad student who started recording videos for his students to, um, the students who was TA to explain stuff and then turned that into, into um, making enough of a living on YouTube um, that he was able to not go into research. Um, he, he's pretty good too. He explains things in a really conversational way, makes it pretty easy. He's pretty funny. At least, at least I find him funny. Uh, your mileage may vary. Um, but those are two go-tos, both YouTube. Go to Khan Academy, Professor Dave Explains. If you want help, if you want just different explanation than me, um, something about the way I explain things just is not resonating with you, it's not sinking in, try having somebody else explain it. There we go. All right. We ended talking about ionic nomenclature on Monday. How do we name? Nomenclature is just the fancy name for how do you name stuff. So here's some practice. What are our rules, though, first of all, for naming ionic compounds? Does anybody remember? Just say the name of the cation, and then you say the name of the anion, right? Anion names, the negative ions end in ide at this point. We'll talk about polyatomic ions later today if we have time. Um, and the cations, the metal ions, usually, their name doesn't change. But if it's something, if it's a transition metal that can have multiple possible charges, what do we do? We use those Roman numerals. We just say the name, or we make the charge part of the name. All right, so for the top half, what's the name for the top left? What's the, the cation? CR is what? Chromium. Can chromium have more than one possible charge? Yes. What's the charge on chromium? And how do we know that? Because it has to balance out the anion. And we know that chloride, by looking at the periodic table, we can say, oh, chlorine needs to gain one electron to be stable, right? So chloride has a negative one charge. If chloride has a negative one charge and it takes three of them to balance out a chromium, then chromium must have a plus three charge. So it's just the name of the um, material is chromium three chloride. Um, I'm not sure why they chose to use Roman numerals and not standard Arabic numerals when it comes to using these because Roman numerals are a pain in the butt once you get past three, right? Um, I'm not going to be super picky once you get past three. I expect everybody can do Roman numerals up to three, right? Um, four versus six gets a little confusing easy to mess yourself up if you're not used to dealing with that. If you wrote chromium three like this, that's a pretty minor deduction if there's any deduction. We'll just say there, there's no deduction. You, you should do it in Roman numerals because that's more universal. It's good practice. But on a testing situation, if you're worried about, I'm going to mix up four versus six, write four in Arabic numerals write six in Arabic numerals, and then we don't need to worry about it, okay? However, other chemistry instructors might not be so kind, so I want you to be familiar with it um, when it comes to how it's supposed to be written. And just for reference, 
one, two, three, five minus one, five, five plus one. To keep those straight. Probably over explaining that, especially since I just said it, I'm not going to be picky about it and you could just write them the normal way, but um, a one and then a five means it's the five minus one. All right. How about CUI? What does that compound? What's the name? Copper, what? Copper one. Flora, Ida. How about SRS? Do we need Roman numeral for that one? And why not? Because we it's in column two, so we always know that it's a plus two when it's an ion. Right? Column one is always plus one when it's an ion. Column two is always plus two. Then we have our six that are grouped together. Aluminum, gallium, indium, zinc, cadmium, and silver. Everything else needs a Roman numeral. So strontium sulfide. How about MN3N2? If it's not as easy to figure out what the charge is, it can be helpful rather than just writing out to begin with, start by figuring out what the charges are. What's the charge on the manganese? Or sorry, what's the charge on the nitride? And there's two of them to equal the same as three manganese ions. So what's the charge on the manganese? So manganese two nitride. Do we need a Roman numeral for, for silver? We don't even need to work backwards to figure out what the charge is on silver, right? We know what the charge is on silver always. <clears throat> if it's an ion, it's always a plus one. So it's just silver oxide. Last but not least, TiO2. What's the charge on the oxide? Two minus. So what's the charge on titanium? Plus four. So it's titanium four oxide. For whatever reason, that compound in particular trips people up. Partly, I think, because um, that's actually one of the active ingredients in sunscreen, in, this, in um, the sunscreen that you rub on your skin, not the spray on kind. Um, and on sunscreen bottles, a lot of times it's labeled as titanium dioxide. That's not the proper name. It's descriptive. It tells you what it is, but that's not the right way to use that prefix. We'll get into using those prefixes um, today for covalent compounds. But for ionic compounds, you don't use those prefixes. Mono, di, tri. That doesn't show up in ionic compounds. So... Don't be tempted. That's titanium four. Oxide. Um, if you went, if you went with how um, nutritional facts or um, inactive ingredients and things like that labeled um, the compounds, you'd never have the right names. The, they use the wrong names for stuff all the time um, just because there's all sorts of industry, indus, industry standards. Like if you've ever read the back of a shampoo bottle, it's they don't even say water. They call it aqua, right? Because in the beauty industry, they refer to water as aqua instead of calling it water. I don't know why. 
but they're allowed to write that on their ingredients. Um, they don't let nutri nutritional facts get away with that for food. They have to say water, but for the beauty industry, they can say aqua. There's all sorts of weirdness like that um, if you look up ingredients. So we'll stick to the IUPAC names because those are the ones that the chemists have decided are, I won't say beyond reproach, but are standardized and unambiguous enough um, that we will we'll continue to use those. Is there anything tricky going the other direction? Not really, right? In fact, in a lot of ways, it's easier. You just have to start by writing out what the ions are and then figure out how many you need for each of them. So let's do nickel two chloride. Well, the two is helpful, right? Because then we know it's nickel with the two, two plus. We know that chloride is a minus one. So how many do we need of each of them? What's the formula? We multiplied that one by two, we get everything adding up to zero, right? It's just like finding your lowest common denominator in, in um, math class. Do one more. Let's look at zinc oxide. What's the charge on zinc? It's plus. It's one of those that doesn't have, um, that only has one possible charge as an ion, right? So look at the periodic table. How many valence electrons could it lose to become stable? So that makes it a plus two charge, right? What's the charge on oxide? Two minus. So how many of each do we need? One of each. All right, the reason I wanna do this one as an example is because there's a shortcut to figuring out how, from the charges how many you need of each of them, right? You may have even heard it in another science class. You just like grab the charges and you swap them and put them down as subscripts, right? Don't think about it like that though. I'm not writing that up there and teaching you that way because that would be Zn2O2 in this case, right? It's not wrong to do it that way. You just have to remember to reduce it afterwards. And that's an extra step people forget. So I prefer to just have you make sure that you make the charges add up to zero instead, figure out how many you need of each of them. Um, even if it takes a little bit of extra thought, it's gonna save you trouble down the line. Right, because that is wrong. There's only one, there's only one element where you're allowed to do that. And that's because Mercury one doesn't exist as an individual ion. Mercury one exists as this complex where the two mercury one atom ions are stuck together. So the one case where you're allowed to write it like this is if you have something like mercury one chloride is actually written like this. That is the only case. Every other time you need to remember to reduce it. So it's better just to keep track. I, I prefer it that way anyway, probably because it's not the way I was taught, the, the swapping of the charges and subscripts and all that. <clears throat> all right. Questions on naming ionic compounds. So I'll just... Okay. A little bit more in-depth maybe than you've had before, but probably mostly review, right? Okay. Let's talk about 
about atomic masses. I kept hinting at this one and it kept getting pushed to the back of, of lectures and we haven't gotten to these yet. There was a home, um, one of the homework problems had this, right? So when we're doing these weighted averages, we didn't we didn't do this in, in lecture yet, right? I'm, I'm not off base with that. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, when we had our, um, our final grade in the Excel lab, we did a final grade was equal to um, the, the percentage weights of each category times the score in that category, right? So we'd say, okay, well, the, the weight, let's see, I'm trying to decide how I'm gonna write this out. Um, the weight of the quiz is, times the score in quizzes and just do that for all the categories, right? Plus the weight of homework times the score in homework. We just literally add the pieces up. And then the last category was exams, right? The weight of the exams times the score in the exams. So in our fictional class that we did, that was pretty easy, right? Because we had we had numbers for the scores that were just the percentage in each category. And then the weight for each of them was just how much we wanted them to matter, right? So it was, if I'm remembering right, it was like, what, 20% 20, 20 quizzes, doesn't really matter the exact numbers. Uh, I'm just just testing my own memory, see if I can come up with it. This is what we've ended with, right? And then it was 0.3, 30% on the exam percentage. That's all well and good. That looks nice and neat because we have these nice neat percentages as decimals. The atomic masses work the same exact way. They still are a weighted average, except we don't just get to arbitrarily decide what the weights are. The way that, that it's um, the atomic masses on the periodic table are determined is that the weight for each mass is based on how likely you are to find it. Or what you could think of it as what percentage of the atoms on Earth are that isotope? So let's see, we can go with, we'll go with chlorine since I know that one ish off the top of my head. Chlorine is, what's the mass of chlorine? It's 35.453, right? That comes from the fact that you've got about a 75% chance. of finding chlorine 35 times the mass of chlorine 35. And the only other isotope you're likely to find is chlorine 37, which occurs about one in four. On average, when you if you grabbed a chlorine atom at random, there's a 75% chance you you grab a chlorine 35, and there's a 25% chance you grabbed a chlorine 37. So what's the weighted average? If I grabbed a hundred atoms and then found the average mass of all of them. It's going to be 0.75 times the mass of chlorine 35, the, the likelihood of getting one outcome times the weight or times the mass of that outcome. Right? And so if there are more than two, um, two categories, it doesn't matter as long as they add up to 100%, right? Just like up here, we had as many categories for these different scores as we 
I mean, I, we could keep adding more and more as long as their weights add up to one. Right? And so that's what this, this kind of confusing, intimidating looking formula is, is the mathematical way of saying for however many isotopes you have, you're going to take the likelihood of that isotope and multiply it by the mass of that isotope. So atomic mass equal to this term here. Have you seen this before? As if you've taken stats, you've seen that before, right? That means sum. It just means add everything up. Of all, and this, this term here is sometimes called natural abundance. Also called mole fraction. And it's not an X or an italicized X. It's actually a Greek letter, pi, C-H-I. So do like a little curly Q with a straight line backwards. It's usually how it's done. Um, that is your likelihood. That's your probability term. It's just saying this mole fraction is literally just saying, okay, out of one mole, how many moles are each of these different things? So it's our likelihood term. And then times the mass of that isotope. Likelihood of that isotope times the mass of that isotope. And you just add up all the possibilities. And so this is great mathematically that we have a way we can write this. It's universal for everything. That's not all that helpful when it comes to actually doing any algebra or solving for anything though, right? Usually what the first thing you're going to want to do if you need to solve for something is kind of blow this up into however many terms you have. Like we had three terms here. We had quizzes, homework, exams. For chlorine, we had two terms because there was only two possible isotopes on Earth. However many isotopes you have, that's how many terms you're going to have added together. All right, so let's do a practice. Um, also, this was not actually, this was actually from last quarter or last semester. Um, quiz question. Somebody asked about why the mass, some of the mass numbers have brackets around them and their whole numbers instead of being, um, instead of being a weighted average. Those are your synthetic elements. So if you look at technetium, for instance, technetium just has, for mass, it just has a brackets and it says 98. It's because all of the, the synthetic elements, the elements that aren't found in nature on Earth, they're all, they're pretty much all radioactive. And so what they have when you see these brackets, it's just the most common or the most stable isotope that you can make. But since they don't occur in nature, they don't have a weighted average to figure out what their atomic mass is. It just has has the one specific isotope listed as the most stable isotope. All right, so once again, it's chlorine. It's one of the few ad elements that has a significant, that doesn't have really, really small um, natural abundance. So let's find the, the atomic mass from, from these numbers. If we know the percent abundance and we know what the masses are of 35 and 37, how do we get the atomic mass? You just take them and add them together. Your percent abundance, 0.76, times the mass of chlorine 35 is 
34.9689. And then the percent abundance for chlorine 37 is, 20, is 0.24. This is in AMU or grams per mole. 36.9659. We only have two isotopes, so we need two, two natural abundances and two masses. That's all it takes, and then we just add the pieces together. That should give us something close to 35 point, whatever it is, 35.453. What's the calculator answer give us? Why doesn't it match periodic table exactly? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the numbers I gave you. How many sig figs do we have here? Only two, which means technically we only get to keep two sig figs here, right? Which means it's 35 plus or minus one with these numbers. Really, if I wanted us to be able to report this many digits, I should have given us more values here, right? If I had more digits on these percent abundances, we'd be able to keep five sig figs or at least more sig figs. So those periodic table values have a lot of sig figs on them, right? because scientists and geologists have done a really good job at, at expanding these percent abundances to a lot of sig figs. And which means we're able to keep more sig figs when we find these weighted averages. Let's do one more. So turns out not every source of an element has the same percent abundances. In fact, we can, we can actually change those percent abundances, not by hand, but by going through a process called enriching um, certain elements or certain isotopes. Enriched uranium is just uranium that has a higher than normal percentage of uranium-238 compared to 235. So, Basically, from some, in some cases, in this case, so isotopic composition for lithium from naturally occurring minerals is 7.5% lithium-6 and 92.5% lithium-7. But then there's a, if you have a commercial source of lithium recycled from military sources, point, there's 3.75% lithium-6 and the rest lithium-7. That's going to be a different atomic mass for the lithium from those two sources. And to take it further, different planets are going to have different atomic masses because the way that all the elements settled out when the solar system was forming caused different isotopic ratios at different, at, uh, different planets, at different points in the orbit around the sun. So if we want to find lithium... Let's just do the natural, um, the natural source. So it's seven point five percent percent lithium six and ninety two point five percent lithium seven. What's the atomic mass? Well. This is what I mean by the first thing you do when you get your problem is you blow up that that um, sigma notation so that you have all of the terms you need already written out. The atomic mass is percent abundance or the natural abundance of lithium six times the mass of lithium six plus the abundance of lithium seven times the mass of lithium seven. All of those numbers are given to us, right? 
All we have to do is plug them in. 0 0.075 times mass of lithium-6, which is 6.01512. And 0.925 times 7.0. 1600. All right. Sig figs get tricky on this one though. So we actually want to do we have we're mixing operations here, right? So you want to do your multiplication and write your answers out first before you do your addition. Because we only get to keep two sig figs on this first one. So what do we get for this first term? 0 0.075 times 6.01512. And we only get to keep one, two sig figs there, right? And then how about over here? We get to keep three sig figs. What do we get? Six point four. four nine. Yeah. So we only got to keep two sig figs here, keep three sig figs here, but when we add them, we keep to the same decimal place, right? So we're going to keep to the hundredths place. Even though that gives us a final answer with three sig figs because of the order of operations. So our atomic mass winds up being 6.94. Does anything change really if I make it an algebra problem in, instead of just straightforward arithmetic? Well, I am assuming that you know how to do algebra, but when you blow up that sigma notation, I just erased this, but I'm going to rewrite it. If I give you the atomic mass and ask you to solve for one of these other pieces, there's still nothing really tricky about that, right? The more possible isotopes you have, the more information I have to give you in the problem. So the first thing you do is just blow it up write all of them out, and then see what you're missing. In this case, we're missing the atomic mass and we're given everything on the right side of the equal sign, right? But if it was something else, if I gave you the atomic mass and I said, what's the percent abundance of lithium seven, then it's an algebra problem, but it's still not tricky, right? You're just solving for this. Start plugging in numbers, moving stuff around, get the variable by itself. And that's the problem in the um, in the homework from Tuesday, right? I think it it was missing a percent abundance. You had to solve for it. This is all there is to it. However many terms you have, write it out like this and start filling in variables. All right. Any questions on atomic masses right now? It's one of those things that we're now that we've seen it, aren't really going to see it again until the midterm because in general, we're going to be dealing with um, with mixtures of isotopes. So in general, we're just going to be looking at the periodic table. Um, there are a few problems that you'll see here and there where it matters what the percent abundances are, but in general, it's not a topic that comes up that much unless you go into nuclear chemistry. So let's talk about covalent compounds. And this is going to get to that last question from the quiz where somebody asked what happens when these orbitals interact with each other. So 
if we have a, a metal and a non-metal, ionic compounds make a lot of sense because you've got something trying to give away electrons, something trying to gain electrons, right? Everybody can be happy with that, right? Not happy. They're not really happy little atoms. They're just stable or unstable. Everything can be stable by just giving away electrons and then something else accepts those electrons. If you have non-metals, if you have only non-metals present, you can't do that because all of your non-metals are all trying to gain electrons at the same time. So what happens instead, if you if you have only non-metals around, is those non-metals get a full valence by sharing electrons instead of by stealing electrons. Right? And so what we call that, it's called a covalent bond, which is a term I'm sure you've heard. Um, and I'm actually a little bit ashamed of how long it took me to realize where the NML, you know how much I love etymology at this point, right? This term literally means the electrons are in two valences at once. It took me 15 years after the first time I heard this word before I actually stopped and thought about it and realized why it's called a covalent bond. Because literally all that's happening is you put electrons in a space where they can be in both orbitals at the same time. And so that gets to that the heart of that question, what happens when these atomic orbitals interact? Well, in some cases, they act, when they overlap, we actually get a new shape. Um, this figure is, is uh, a representation of the energy. Um, we call it a potential energy surface, where if you have two atoms, two, we usually use hydrogen as the standard because it only has one electron. So that makes things simpler. If you have two hydrogen atoms, and let's say that the rest of the universe doesn't exist, the entire universe is just two hydrogen atoms separated by an infinite distance. Both of them are trying to gain one more electron to become more stable, right? So there's actually an attractive force, no matter how far apart you separate those two hydrogen atoms, they're attracted towards each other because no matter what, the, the only two electrons in the entire universe, can't you can't fill both valences at the same time unless they share them. And so what happens is this bottom, the x-axis here, we call it the, the distance between the two hydrogen atoms. And when you're all the way out at infinity, this is basically, this line is like an asymptote approaching zero. The, the lowest possible energy that you can get is going to be when you allow both of those hydrogen atoms to slowly come towards each other to the point where, in the, as you start doing that, you get lower and lower in energy until you reach some minimum value. In this case, in calculus terms, that's a that's a global minimum. What that means is that there's some distance apart that is most that is more stable than any other distance between those two hydrogen atoms, because that's the distance where both of those electrons are close enough to being in the one s orbital for both hydrogens at the same time. They're not really in both hydrogens at the same time, because what does an s orbital look like? We talked about that, right? What's the shape that an s orbital has? It's a sphere, right? So basically, we have, when they're all the way separated, we have a 1s and a 1s. Call that a spin up and that a spin down. As they get closer and closer together, there's some finite distance that looks more like a Venn diagram. Right, where you still have a 1s and a 1s, but where they overlap, if the electrons are in that space, then they're in both valences at the same time. That's what a covalent bond is.
A covalent bond is when you allow two electrons to occupy the same space so that they can be both atoms' valences simultaneously. Yes. Because, so this turns out if you take those two spheres, um, the lowest energy state that we can have is not actually keeping these two orbitals as spheres. These two, those spheres are just, just mathematical functions where you're likely to find a, a, an electron. But if they're just mathematical functions, you can actually mix them together. Everybody's taken algebra two where you have, um, you can have, okay, H of X is equal to F of X plus G of X. Does that look familiar? Maybe a little bit. You didn't really do much with it. It was one of those where in algebra two, they define it. And then in calculus, it comes back when you actually have to start taking derivatives of things. Um, but basically all that says is you can make a new function by mixing together other functions. And in fact, if you do it right, you can actually have make it a weighted average of the two functions. So if you take a 1s orbital and another 1s orbital and you mix them together, you can get another function that look, is what we call a sigma bond. And a sigma bond looks like two orbitals overlapping with each other. And then you kind of like erase the stuff where they don't overlap. So the bond, we can maybe see a little bit here. See if it, this figure shows it a little bit. This little region in between the two that's a darker blue color, that's where the bond actually is. And then there is still a finite possibility that you can find the electrons not in that Venn diagram area, but it gets it approaches zero asymptotically as you get further away from that, because that's the space where everything can be stable at once. And having everything stable at once is more likely in this situation than making one of the atoms stable and the other atom not stable. The other thing that's really tricky about the about orbitals in general is they don't actually have defined shapes. They're, it's a three-dimensional shape is how we represent it, but it's actually a four-dimensional object um, because it really is more like a probability cloud that's vaguely sphere-shaped. So if you can picture so what's the example I've used before? Um, if you can picture a bell curve where this distance is the radius, the distance from the center. So picture, so if I said this, okay, you've got a circle and then, but really it's not a circle, it's a bell curve where the peak is around that, that point there. You could do it like a heat map, right? Where it looks like a circle, but it's like red hot right around the line and then it kind of falls off as you go like that. These orbitals that look like spheres are really spheres with an embedded bell curve. There's a region where you're likely to find the electron, but they're not a defined shape. So even, even when they're totally separate, it's not like you could say the electron is definitely within this space. The probability of finding the electron outside of that space has a finite probability as well. Um, it just, uh, as you get further and further away from that sphere, it approaches zero. So if you're thinking about, about orbitals, properly, or at all, you're thinking in four dimensions, not including time. So we are literally expanding your minds by doing this, making you think in more dimensions than just more variables than just three-dimensional space. If that's concerning to you, 
just hang on. It's going to start feeling more natural eventually, maybe. <clears throat> All right, so what happens when you get, why is there this space here? We could make the orbitals overlap more if we got these closer together, couldn't we? So why is it that it has this, so in hydrogen, this winds up being about 0 0.078 nanometers between the two hydrogens at zero, if they, why do they stay 0 0.078 nanometers apart? If we're trying to get these orbitals to overlap as much as possible, if we got them closer together, they'd be able to overlap more, right? That should make it more stable, right? What ha Why do, does this start going up in energy again then? Because there's another piece, the puzzle, right? It's not just the electrons. Yeah, the electrons would continue to get more stable the closer we got them together. But those nuclei are both positively charged. And the nuclei push each other away. So as you get closer than that 0 0.078 nanometers, now all of a sudden the nuclei pushing away the other nuclei, or the nucleus pushing away the other nucleus starts to become the dominant force. And it basically, this winds up looking like an asymptote. It's not really like a parabola. This looks a lot like an asymptote until you get to really small distances, at which point fusion happens. But that's a whole separate force that we're not going to introduce right now. All right. No quizzes on covalent compounds. Yes, ionic compounds. And there'll probably be a question on atomic mass. All right. Check, do the quiz over the weekend. See everybody on Monday. So. So let's start. That wet your appetite for the what the door what happens to the orbitals when they get close? Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That was actually a no worth the Nobel Prize, the idea that you can mix these all together to make uh, was uh, worth the Nobel Prize for Linus Pauling. Once he's one of one of three people that's ever won two Nobel Prizes. Um, one of his was for that idea about hybridization. You know, you can mix these functions together. That's really cool. It is. I didn't think about it as a function until I got to grad school and I had this Eastern European guy who was like, what is, what is an orbital? You've known this since kindergarten. And he made, and he eventually he's like, nobody said anything. He's like, it's, it's a function. Come on, guys. No problem. Have a good weekend.